Christopher Nolan will reportedly receive 20% of Tenet's first dollar gross, which means he gets a percentage of the box office revenue beginning with the film's release, rather than when the film finally turns a profit. Okay, now you can turn off the video. <laughs> Greetings all, I'm Jake S. Weissman. They were supposed to release Tenet yesterday worldwide. Obviously they didn't. They've pushed the date twice since this original date, but that means that we got a couple of new articles. Some news, the UK will be opening movie theaters August 1st. Hey guys, I can read. I see that headline says live theater and music venues. Dig this paragraph. Nevertheless, this is a significant breakthrough as the UK continues its fourth phase of reopening. Earlier this month, movie theaters in England already began slowly opening their doors on July 4th. Like the upcoming August measures, English cinemas were allowed to reopen with socially distant seating for people from different households, as well as limited capacity, staggered showtimes, guaranteed deeper cleaning, and a ban on sing-along screenings. While some independent theaters have been wary of still opening this month, cinema branches of Odeon, Showcase, and Everyman have already begun the new rollout. Cineworld has pushed cinema reopenings until the end of the month. That means China will be opening movies the week before, then the UK will be opening. American movie theaters will be open, but many major markets won't be open until phase five. Many independent theaters are open already, playing recycled fare, waiting for the new content to come. Bigger markets pretty much are going to be waiting until phase five, which I've heard from an IDES employee that phase five can be anywhere between six months to 12 months to 18 months away. Many analysts that I've been reading have been saying that they're not looking for any new releases until mid 2021. But boy, will there be a lot of content and our cup will runneth over Mr. Hat. Chinese theaters are opening what we've learned today is that they are not accepting films with a runtime longer than 120 minutes. Tenet is decidedly longer than 120 minutes. This brings up many questions. Is that 120 minute runtime including trailers and previews? If this happens in China, will American theaters take this as a sign as well? Will American theaters then say, well, the runtime needs to be 120 minutes. But you know here, we have a half hour of ads, we have pre-shows, we have trailers. That's not even including waiting in line, waiting in concession, how long you have to be there. Sometimes this experience, when it's a movie like Tenet, can be four or five hours long. Waiting in line outside the theater, waiting for your show time, getting your snacks, sitting down, enjoying the pre-show, enjoying the trailers, finally watching the movie, and then it takes at least 10 minutes to clear out. Meanwhile, all these poor ushers have masks on and they have to sweep up as fast as they can, picking up hot dogs and popcorn and everything that people are shoving under their masks. I suspect there will be more things on the ground because people will miss their mouths. So I use the phrase playing chicken a lot. I do really feel like many industries are right now. Tenet has become a symbol of when the entire industry can open up from production to exhibition. Everybody who's saying it's totally safe to open up has some sort of money involved. Deep stakes in having these movies come out in 2020. Everyone who doesn't have those stakes say the theaters have issues coming up. And if the theaters want to survive, they need content. But if people want to survive, they're going to have to wait until 2021. And they haven't been able to marry those two things yet. I'll keep you posted. You know that's what this entire thing is, is just figuring out when those two things are going to get married. I didn't realize before today how much stake Christopher Nolan really had in all of this. I've never heard of a filmmaker having that kind of a deal. That's incredible. 20% of box office before profits? I thought as high as you could go was Final Cut. He got Final Cut movies ago. He wants this to open because he's going to get a big slice. A real big slice. It's so unfortunate that all of it has ended up on his shoulders, but he has a lot to choose from. He has to decide whether it's more important to deal with his artistic side, 
you know, running for the finish line. He's been working on this movie for three years, well before the cough started. He was so close to being able to release it. It's been done for months. He just wants to be done with the project. I really respect that. But also, it's coming at the cost of hundreds of thousands of lives, if not more. And that's not even talking about the audience. I'm just talking about the people working the theaters right now. I read that between the budget and the constant pushes and the marketing, Tenet needs to make $800 million to break even. That's $800 million to make zero dollars. And Nolan will be immediately seeing a cut of that. I wonder what he had to give up. I wonder what his salary was for this movie if he took it down. Oh, pay me a half a million dollars, but give me 20% of the box office before the profits. That's ballsy for even Jack Nicholson, man. That's taking it to a next level. Please let me know if, if this has happened before where someone really did this. This is some Spielberg-sized cojones, which it's been going in that direction anyway. I mean, people look up to Nolan as though he is the next Kubrick. I have my opinions on that. That's fine. Like I said, the movie was supposed to be dropped yesterday, so the New York Times dropped an article saying Christopher Nolan says Tenet will come out this summer. Should it? There's some really interesting things in this article. I'll link it below. But a big chunk of this article discusses how Nolan himself wrote an op-ed in the spring when all of this started saying, theaters are gonna need our help. We need to put out content because the theater experience is going to crumble. And it's very admirable. But then in pushing the movie twice, the very theaters that he's quoting as wanting to save are the very same theaters I was talking about a couple days ago in that LA Times article that said, we tried to open because we thought Tenet was gonna come out, then they pushed Tenet a month, and now we're losing so much money that I don't think we're gonna be able to be open when Tenet finally does come out. So it's all under this guise of, oh, we need to help this experience we shot on film, this needs to be in the theaters. I wonder how separated he really is from all of this. It would be so awesome if he could see this conversation happen in real time. Like I've been saying, I want to put a timestamp on it. The same thing he's so primed on saving is the same thing that he's inadvertently killing. And that's a New York Times article pretty much saying that. There are more articles from The Week, NME, and The Observer each article talking about Christopher Nolan's personal and financial stake in the movie and why he's still keeping it in play. Everything is taking their note from Tenet. If Tenet moves, Mulan will move, Quiet Place will move, September, which is already barren, will be totally dead, will be pushing to October, waiting to see again. Then they're gonna do it again and again until it's 2021. People are very concerned about pirating. I was kind of glib about it the last time I talked about it, but the more I do think about pirating, yeah, you can't drop Tenet in China because the next day it'll be here for free. If he's so Kubrick, he should be playing chess right now. Nolan needs to be playing some three-dimensional chess. Think like Kubrick, man. You already do, right? So why not be the man? You are in such an amazing position of power to take the first step forward into the future of this industry. And you are so hung up on film and movie theaters. Those beautiful romantic cinema paradiso reasons why you are a filmmaker now. It's hard to believe that I keep making these videos out of romance. I have a complete romance for the industry. I have a complete romance for cinema and Toto from production and writing, from when it's just an idea, to being made, to how it gets seen by audiences. It's this great cycle, it never stops. I'm just as obsessed with it as everybody else. Which is why I think it's foolish not to take this opportunity to really think about what the future is going to be and what you really care about. If you care so much about pirates, is it worth killing a bunch of people so that your movie doesn't get pirated. I've never made a movie that was worth $800 million. Maybe that's worth some death. You tell me. 
I will be digging into the future of streaming. This summer has brought up some very interesting things. Thank you so much, Dave McNair, for bringing this to my attention. I'm going to dig deeper into it in, in a future episode. But for the time being, it really is something to think about. What if Tenet was dropped on Netflix? If Tenet needs to make $800 million back to make $0, then at the very least, Warner Brothers is probably looking for a billion dollars. They want to make a bill. If Netflix were to acquire, they would need to pay $1 billion for one movie. Is it worth any individual streamer to do such a thing? Let's think about it and then we'll come back because my friend Dave definitely brought up that movies that are made specifically for streamers are doing really, really well, while movies that were made for theaters that are being thrown on Google Play and Amazon Prime and iTunes and stuff are just kind of floundering. I think it's fascinating if you were to throw Tenet into that ring. But Tenet, again, represents the theatrical experience and when we can open up and how we're gonna make this money back because it's an ungodly investment. And it sounds like Christopher Nolan has a lot of personally at stake, whether artistically or financially or very much both. What I would like him to think of are the ethical implications of it all. Maybe that's too much to ask. He's putting lives at risk by not pushing this and setting an example. He already is the king, so he doesn't really have to do anything. But what if Christopher Nolan came out and said, my movie isn't as important as the general health of the world? Like, no one said anything like that. There aren't producers that are saying, oh, we're making sure that it's safe. Oh, we're in tandem with the theaters to make sure everything's safe for all of our blah, 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 blah. But no one's coming out and straight up saying, explicitly, hi, my name is Christopher Nolan. My money and my artistic integrity are not equal to the health and livelihood of the population of the earth. Stop pretending like this is more than about money. And I need to know the last time Christopher Nolan worked at a movie theater. The last time Christopher Nolan went to a movie theater that wasn't so up its own ass because Christopher Nolan was going to a movie theater. Again, thanks to Dave McNair, we'll get to that. Also, Addie Doe. Thanks, Addie. You're a lot of fun. You wake me up at three in the morning with your singing. And as always, thank you for your continued support, Hilary Strohshan. The song of the episode? Still crazy after all these years. I feel like a man in a turkey suit. The book of the episode is Ellen Forney's Marbles. This is a great graphic novel. I'll put a link to the Amazon page below. I love it. It's about her personal struggle with depression and bipolar and it really puts some stuff into perspective. Not only do I deal with my depression, I'm friends with a lot of people who deal with my, uh, who deal with my depression, who deal with depression. And I also know that a lot of, there's a lot of crossover between those people and people who like graphic novels. So this is a great book, you should check it out. The movie of the episode is a film called Cast Away on the Moon. It's a Korean film. It may be my favorite Korean film. I don't even know how to start describing this film to you. A man jumps off of a bridge trying to kill himself because he's so in debt. He ends up washed up on an island underneath the highway, completely isolated from the rest of Seoul, Korea. It's a true island, but he's right in the middle of the city. Meanwhile, over here there's a building with an agoraphobic young woman who stays in her room with the windows closed all day except for five minutes a day where she pretends to be an astronaut and takes photos. One of these five minutes, she takes photos and finds the man on the island. And these two people who are completely isolated in their own way, but in the middle of a city, form a long distance relationship. I think it's beautiful. It's absolutely hysterical. I honestly don't know where to find a copy. Netflix used to have a lot of great Korean films and now they don't. So if you can watch Cast Away on the Moon, do not hesitate. Typewriter, it's a typewriter.
big this one video. But it's a typewriter, typewriter. And it's a typewriter. And afterwards, click this other video. Clack, clack, click, clack, clack.